Hi, everybody. Welcome to our friendship space. Um, this is a friendship space. Anybody's here is a friend of mine, whether you like it or not. Um, today, I am going to, we're going to be talking about queer friendship spaces with our amazing panelists. Uh, my name is Rob Kirby. I'm your moderator. And I am going to start things off after I introduce everyone. I'm going to, I have a few opening remarks, and then we'll just get to the panel and and feel free to raise your hands if you have something really pressing otherwise we will have a Q&A like the last 10 minutes or so something like that yeah um, I'm gonna start by introducing each of our panelists um, we're gonna go our alphabetical order um, on the far oh look at they're all in alphabetical order it's, like, it's Wait, like amazing really? That's nice so cool. <laughs> you guys just we tried folks this. <laughs> okay First of all, there's Archie Bong Giovanni, uh, a comics artist and illustrator who focuses on making work that's gay and good. They're the pro, pro co-creator of the award-winning A Quick and Easy Guide to They Them Pronouns and the creator of Grease Bats, a serialized comic about two queer BFFs navigating dating and late-stage capitalism, which, you know, those two go hand in hand. Um, and, and Archie is also the author of history comic Stonewall and their work has appeared in The New Yorker, The Nib, Vice, and Autostraddle. They live in Minneapolis, much like myself, and they um, just get, were nominated for an Ignatz Awards for their amazing new book, Mimosa, which you totally need to read. Um, and next we have Emma Jane, who is the Ignatz and Prism Award-winning cartoonist behind LSBN and the Trans Girls Hit the Town series. Um, and her work deals with the everyday lives of queer people in both grounded and sci-fi settings. She has published work in Silver Sprocket with Silver Sprocket and Disquette Press. Her new book is from Silver Sprocket, and her greatest ambition is to someday see a ghost in real life. And Lawrence Lindell is an artist, musician, and educator from California who works in many artistic disciplines, including comics, music, illustration, and mixed media. He's the co-founder of Lahina House, uh, Lin, Lin, Lania House, Lania. Lania, okay. um, and is the author of the graphic novel Blackward, which just comes, which comes out uh, like any day now? Uh, two weeks. I yeah, think. and it's great. And I also highly recommend it. It's a wonderful book. Um, and that's from Drawn and Quarterly. And you can also find comics from Lawrence in The New Yorker, The SF Examiner, and Razor Cake. And finally, there's Al Varela, uh, they, them, who makes comics like Young, Dumb, and Queer that explore queer relationships, platonic or romantic. They also create music zines, cataloging their personal listening habits. And they graduated from CS CCS this year with their thesis on two projects, Young, Dumb, and Queer, Volume 1, and Bunsy and Squeaks, ready for adventure. Al says they spent two years in Vermont with a community of cartoonists, most of them queer, and found a community that felt more comfortable than any other they'd experienced. So, welcome our panelists. Um, and um, I'm gonna just, like I said, I'm gonna start with a brief autobiographical thing and then we'll just, uh, just ask questions and won't talk much anymore, probably. Um, I've been coming to SPX uh, off and on like since 2006. My first, that was like 20, almost 20 years ago, like 20 or 17 years ago. And I remember sitting with Justin Hall, Craig Bostic and Tim Fish. And we were this little gay thing, gay boy thing going on. <laughs> um, and I don't really know, I, I had a new book out called The Book of Boy Trouble, and we had our little thing, and it was a fun experience, but it was not, the show was very much, we were like somewhat isolated, I felt. Um, it was very hetero, it was very uh, heteronormative, absolutely no, no problems, nobody was, was nasty or anything. A lot of people gave us a side, like, my goodness, those exotic queer, those gay <laughs> boys, weird. Um, and, uh, so it all went well, and I put out another book the next year. And um, this time, Tim Fish bought a block of tables, and, and we were all together. Um, and, and at those tables were me, Justin Holligan, Jen Camper, uh, Monica Gallagher, I believe, was there, Victor Hodge, and uh, several other people that are not really in comics anymore. Um, 
so, and we were joking about how we, you know, we created our own little gay ghetto, haha. -ha. Um, it was our own little queer space. And there were other uh, creators like Joey Allison Sayers uh, was just a few tables down. But so we, we felt like we were, it was getting bigger. We felt like things were happening a little bit. But uh, yeah, we went from gay ghetto to then in 2012, let's skip ahead. And I'm tabling with Mari Naomi and we, and there were, and by then there was actually even uh, a, a website, a, a presence online telling you where to get the queer comics in the room. And I think that still exists now. I do, I do believe. But it, you know, and and they had a map, and you would just tell them, hey, I'm going to be at E12 or whatever, and they would put you on. And so people knew how to find us. So we were growing, but there was not a single panel about any from any queer people whatsoever. And. I complained to Robbie C, uh, aka Rob Clow. I said, Rob, you know, can, could, you know, why isn't there any anything happening but that? And Rob is such an amazing ally. His his mind was immediately. I could see the wheels turning. And the very next year, I came one more time, and I was actually on a panel. And this was kind of prescient because it was called Queering the Mainstream, and it was about us and Al Nichols and I and. Um, and some other people were on it. And I'm kind of blanking right now. Um, and that was really amazing. So skip ahead even a couple more years, and it had exploded. We, we were everywhere. We were all over. And, and it's even, this is my first one since 2016. And um, I just think that it's a real testament to how queers are a genuine force here. And, and that we've been fully integrated into the fabric of the show. We're, we're like just interwoven, there's no more ghetto, and we're just all there, you know, interspersed everywhere. And, um, and it just really is, it's, it's, a, it's, it, it's a real testament to that persistence and networking and a little bit of faith and stuff, you can really, you can really do it. You can queer, we kind of queered up the mainstream. And that's, that's my observation of the thing, so. So, starting with the big picture, I wanted to ask the panel, in what ways have you gone about creating your own queer friendship spaces, and what specifically are you, are you specifically trying to create, like for who, and, and for what, and for where, uh, and where? And, and, and specifically, the panel wants to know about the spaces themselves, and what, so um, Archie, do you want to start, go alphabetical? Yeah, I can start. Um... As far as like what I'm building now, I don't know really. But um, as far as like previous spaces, I co-produced um, like a queer variety show slash dance night for um, like two years called Daddy with one of my friends, and that was one of the um, inspirations um, behind the plot of my newest graphic novel, Mimosa where a group of people, you know, a group of pals in their mid-30s um, work together and create, like, a, a queer dance night. Um, I think, like, party spaces and um, dance, at, dance nights and events where we can really, like, see each other in our, like, good queer glory are really important. Um, and whenever I'm in those spaces, I'm, I don't know if it's like maybe the drugs or the booze or just like how I am as a person. I'm like, this is where I'm meant to be. I love seeing queer people, like fellow queer people thriving and like feeling really good in their bodies. And um, I feel like spaces like that are where like I tend to gravitate to. Um, and then, you know, have a little bit of experience like behind the scenes um, as well as like participating and trying to make them as great as they can be. Where, Archie, where was it? Uh, do you, where it was, was at there? Ice House. At where? Ice, Ice House? House? Yeah. On Nicolet? Mm hmm Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. Was there anything in particular that, that, about that space that worked well or didn't work well? Or how did you acquire it? Oh, yeah, so Ice House is, um, is like kind of like a music venue slash bar, um, and it was bad. Uh, <laughs> I think that's one of the problems with like kind of like trying to create queer spaces is the lack of queer owned venues. Um, because we go to this venue, the person who's running it is like really trying to get like a gay buck um, and uh, did not like took like the took 
like most of the half the door fee, took the bar, so it like which is which means that like it was harder to make sure that we could per like pay um, our performers and the staff that we had. Um, and th and this was like I don't know quite how long ago it was, but it was a hot minute ago. Um, but because of that venue, we had to use their security, and I think that is like kind of like a major issue in queer trans spaces. Um, we we're trying to make everyone feel like safe and welcome, but if you have like straight security guards, um, people are gonna get misgendered, people are gonna be discriminated against, and it was kind of um, one of the reasons we like, I think partially stopped working or stopped doing it was like, it was frustrating. Um, Minneapolis now has something called security, so you can hire queer security workers at your events, um, which is really badass, and so one, one, there's like another dance night that always has them, and like just having that little, it's not a little change, but like having that kind of change is huge. Um, yeah. And did you, um, did you uh, happen to uh, find another space, or is that just, is daddy just gone Oh, for, daddy's for dead. Now? Daddy died. <laughs> What did you do? Uh, yeah, Will there daddy be a granddaddy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, daddy ended for like a couple of reasons. Like the venue was like frustrating. Um, also, my co-producer moved to Chicago, so like I wasn't gonna do it on my own. Um, and it did, you know, end I think pre-pandemic. And then in Minneapolis, it took like a hot minute. I feel like since yeah. like 2021, 2022 for. Um, events to kind of like start popping back up. And now I don't really feel like in Minneapolis, I have like, I don't really have an urge to kind of create that kind of space again because so many other people have stepped up to the plate. So it is kind of great that there's like a variety of events to choose from in Minneapolis, which I think is like a pretty thriving queer city. Yeah. yeah. I think probably... Do you feel like you kind of started a ball rolling for those specifically trans and lesbian safe, Oof. safe spaces? Or... I don't know if I would say I started the, like got anything started. I mean, in your era maybe? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, it was like, as far as like the production of the show was like really good. However, I don't ever want to be like, we started something because people have always been creating those kind of spaces in Minneapolis. Um, but it was um, a really unique kind of setup where we had like bands and different types of, we had like a mix of like bands and DJs and people doing like different types of performances, whether that be like poetry or like a weird art dance performance or a fashion show, like it was a nice, like it was like an actual variety of stuff, and like people were like people showed up, like they got it was like a really cool space where people dressed to the nines, which was great, um, and got to like really like show off themselves in a way that was also supporting others. Yeah. yeah. Emma, how about you? Um, what what what, how, what has been your experience with uh, friendship spaces? Um, so, my technique is really foolproof, so write this down. <laughs> so, you need to go to college and just be immensely depressed, <laughs> and then you need to join the student-run comics publication, and you need to be little freaks together for a while, and, you know, make friends, and then graduate, and then a year later, you're all transsexuals. Um, that's my that's my big tip. Um, not very replicatable though. <laughs> um, so for me, it's a little stranger because I'm not in Minneapolis or places that are very big. Um, so I live in Ann Arbor. It's a college town, but it's not huge or anything. So uh, it's just different, and I don't think I've. Um, really led anything I would per se, per se but um, certainly been to a lot of things. And it's especially been important since the one gay bar in town shut down. Uh, it was probably 2019, I would say. Um, it wasn't even like COVID related, it's just the people who were running it were 
tired and old. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do it either. It's a lot of work. They had the best breakfast in town too. It's messed up. Uh, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. They also had this wonderful little bookshop that <sighs> we tried to save a couple of times, but also just kind of went under and just the relative size of the community made it hard to sustain. So what a few people in our community did was, well, first tried to make this thing called tea time, which is adorable. It's a pun. Um, it's trans people get together and having tea. And um, someone else in my community used to work at this tea shop and was on really good terms with them and was able to convince them to let us kind of take over the shop after close once a week. Mm -hmm. So it was just a bunch of trans women hanging out. And then, you know, once you invite trans women somewhere and they're like, well, can my trans mask partner come? And they were like, we have literally no reason to say no. So just a bunch of trans people <laughs> hanging out. That's nice. <laughs> uh, but then COVID hit and then that shut down. And some people have um, tried to pick it back up. We eventually ended up in the basement of this Quaker interest house on campus, which is interesting. And people were a little reluctant. Some people were a little reluctant just because it's like explicitly a religious space, but uh, there haven't been any problems or anything. Um, I feel like there was more. I lost well, track of the question. I, I was really interested in that when you said we really had no reason to say no to trans men coming in. How did that feel though? Did, was it, was it, was it, was, did you all like talk about it or, or did, hmm. um, was it sensitive or did you, did it just feel like, no, whatever, cool? I mean, like, not really, <laughs> honestly. It's just like, yeah, our experiences are very different, but at the same time, they're also very similar and, um, I don't know, if anyone did have a problem with it, we didn't really, they did not make their opinion known, okay. which is good because I don't think we really would have, uh, <laughs> would have stood for it. Yeah. Um, and, and like, what's, what's happening, what's for the future? Like, are you finding other spaces to, in Ann Arbor? You're right, it's a small, I mean, it's a, it's a blue little town though, isn't it? I mean, yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, it's also super, super university town. Yeah. And that also has another interesting dynamic where <clears throat> most of the queer people there are like 20, 21. And I'm 31, so I'm not super old, but when the trans night is held at like a punk show, I just don't got it in me anymore. <laughs> like, it's not that I haven't been to a bunch of them, but it's like, I'm tired all the time. <laughs> and I'm only going to get more tired. But, um, yeah, so that's, it's another interesting thing because there isn't explicit partitioning as far as, like, this event is for people this age. But um, sometimes it feels like the scene is pretty young and I'm getting less young. And there are other people who aren't as young, but. Um. Yeah. Archie, you, you, your characters in Mimosa are like, you know, we're gonna tell them, tell them about it. Yeah, yeah, so my characters in Mimosa are in their like mid to late thirties and they talk about going to like, queer spaces and being like the oldest ones at the club. And so that is part of why they start their own like dance night is for like queers over 30. Um, so I feel ya. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you see, yeah. I feel like those characters are already, they have more energy than me. Yeah. They're doing great. Yeah. I am, I'm a sleepy baby, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. But I think what you were saying is like kind of, it is true because I feel like um, we're getting older and there are like more and more people coming out um, just because the climate is a little different, you know, it's like exciting. 
Um, so like it is interesting, I think, that you're in like this town that has like such like a young crowd of people, and like you're like, well, where's our? Like, there's got to. I know there's thirty plus people elsewhere. You know, like yeah. yeah. And another thing with, I swear this is not me being like the youth, <laughs> but no, it's just sometimes when, especially college students. This, I feel so old. Um, I think there is a tendency to be more prone to drama <laughs> that um, doesn't need to affect the space. So you kind of have to be like, this is a personal thing between you two. <laughs> Don't ruin this for everyone else. Um, but it's OK. I was like that. Yeah. We were all like that. Maybe some of you were like really well-adjusted 20-year-olds, or are, and that's great for you. <laughs> I'm so jealous of you. Hang on to that. So Lawrence, you wrote a whole book, Blackboard, about this very topic that we're talking about. Do you want to talk about? Um, I was actually wondering like how bi autobiographical that might be, and like what how your relationship, how your experience relates to what's happening in the book. But yeah, um, I live in the Bay Area, so I was adopted into like one of the gayest places on earth. Um, so I'm always around queer folks, and Blackbird is just a representation of everybody that I'm around. Um, but queer friendship to me has to include black people, like for me to feel safe. So I often look for spaces that black queer people are not just like, oh, we have two of them in the corner, but it's like, a bunch of us, and um, so I made a book about it um, for kids searching for a safe space for black, queer, and weird people. Um, yeah. I don't know what else to say, I'm nervous. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's a book about friendship. I don't, I don't know if I made it a book about friendship. I was just trying to, originally I was making a comic that was, um, exploring what I was going through as a queer person who wasn't even out yet. So I was like, well, if I can be out on the page, maybe I could be out in real life. And then the main character is a black woman who's bi, and I'm also dealing with some kind of like gender stuff. So I'm like, well, maybe if I put a little bit of that on the page, it's a little safer to explore than in real life. And so that's how that yeah. came about. What age group are the kids? I was trying to figure it out. In the, are, they, are they like out of high school or? They're supposed to be 20 somethings, but apparently I made a YA novel and I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know it. So they're, they're whatever age is for a YA novel. You, we could uh, figure out what age they are to us then? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there any one of the, the, the four that in particular is you or? Yeah, they all parts of you. Uh, Lika, the main character, uh, was originally based off of me, and um, Amor is based off of my spouse and a good friend, and they're all based off of real people that I'm around. So yeah. And they they all like they're they're so incredibly supportive of each other, and they and they and they're really open about their medications and all that other mm -hmm. stuff. Um, uh, do you want to talk about that? Like, is that is that like utopian? Do you, I mean, do, do you have friends that are you pretty open with your friends and are can can you guys talk about sensitive things like that or? Yeah, it's like a ref, like I said, a reflection of what I see. Um, I was adopted in, so my spouse is born and raised in the Bay, and I'm from Compton in L.A. area. So when I moved to the Bay area, they just adopted me into their scene um, and made me feel comfortable. So I was kind of reflecting like, oh these spaces do exist where it's like, I mean, I'm not gonna say it's not judgy because we could be judgy as hell, but there's a level of like judgment and then also like acceptance of like, oh, we might talk shit about you, but we got you type of thing. So I wanted to put that in the book. And I mean, as sensitive as the book is and all that, it's also really funny. Like I love the, the way the drawing, that your characters, you, they're very expressive. Like when things are going wrong, like their faces shrink up and you do it, it's very, it's very um, expressionistic. Um, uh, so it's, it's really great. It's a really good book. I really hope you guys will, folks will read it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's just like my love letter to the language of like making comics. 
Uh, I just look at what everyone else is doing and then see like, how can I apply that to my comics work? Like I'm not making anything revolutionary. I'm just, I love comics and this is what we do. So I try to borrow like, oh, what did Schultz do? And how can I put that in like a queer book? And you know, that type of thing. Can y'all hear me by the way? I speak very, very low. It's Al, like you, um, in your notes to me, like when you sent your bio stuff, you said, um, you said that you talked about the community that you found at, C at the Center for Cartoon Studies. And did you, um, can you talk about that? And like your, like the, how did you find that community? And did you, did you feel like you created it or they, that you had a hand in creating it? Or were you, um, how did that just yeah, tell you anything about your experience there that you wanted to share? Um, so first I will say, it's very generous of you to think that I created it as if I have the social ineptitude to do that. <laughs> um, but the way I see it, I think it's more that like queer people just find each other. Um, uh, throughout my life, I've been through many different friend groups. Um, they can be like, you know, through people I've met in school, um, people I've met online and all that kind of thing. And like, it, it was, it's, took, it's taken until CCS for me to find a community that I felt most comfortable in. And it happened to be the one that is the most full of queer people. Um, not to say my other friendships throughout the years were not that. I mean, I, but the thing is, is that I think a lot of my friend groups as I've grown up has just been straight allies. And I didn't realize that like, they were mostly straight allies until I actually, you know, the straight people became the minority within those friend groups. Um, and that includes even like some of my online friendship spaces, which um, I've, like I said, queer people sometimes kind of need to find each other because we don't have, we're, we're a little bit more anxious to really, you know, talk to people. Um, so finding people who we like have similar interests and also, yeah, we just kind of slowly like talk about these kinds of things and we find out things about each other. Um, for my online friends of spaces, it took time to get there because a lot of us thought we were straight or cis um, when we were, when we first met, but like gradually we learned things about ourselves, about each other, um, and it's caused us to become queer. And CCS was the first time where like, Pretty much everyone I just talked to was, was queer. And I didn't realize how comfortable that made me until I thought back to like other friend groups and how uncomfortable I felt in them. Even ones that were very kind and caring to me. I think because I was a bit unsure of, are they going to, would they accept me if I knew, they knew this one thing about me? Um, I never came out to my friends in high school until like after I graduated and everyone's far away from me. So if the bridge is burned, then like it's, it's fine. I'm not, not like I'm gonna see them again, but like having those people like support me, later finding out that some of them themselves are queer, definitely helped. And um, yeah, with CCS, it, um, they, were, they were really, I, I, gave, I give credit to the people who are most like willing to talk to everyone and like just welcome each other in get to know someone and all that and all that. We basically built a community through like, just cause we have a, all have a mutual understanding of each other. Even if we have like an argument, even if like there's some kind of like um, issue that comes up between us, um, there's one mutual agreement that we have and that's usually regarding our queerness. And I think even, I mean, every friend group is messy, but like just the fact that like, there is that one part that we agree on like, makes me feel comfortable around them. And how do you, how do you, uh, how do you deal with friendship? I, your comics are, have a lot, I mean, the, your, your characters are very warm and supportive of each other. Um, is it, does any of that reflect from your real life? I'd say so, yeah. Um, it definitely, I, as someone who can be very socially anxious and can kind of spiral into thinking that like one small action will cause like a turbulence of like failed friendships or people who just kind of view me the different way. Can you tell that I grew up with social media and just the constant <laughs> judgment that happens on there? Um, and like, I've had a lot of instances where like I'm worried that like I, I, I screwed something up. Um, and I would just simply, really all it took is just talking to them um, and just working through it. Having that support system has made, even like with all the different friend groups I've had where I've, made enemies, I've 
just lost touch with people. It's always the ones that like, you know, just talking to them when something goes wrong and we can come out the other side with a mutual understanding. That's what a lot of young, dumb, and queer in particular is drawn from. Because um, it's very difficult, because you know, it's very, I think it's similarly with like what um, Emma was talking about with like the youth, we love drama. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think especially in the age of like social media where like that drama can really spiral into something really public and really like can really affect you in the real world if it's like goes big enough. Um, it's not, it's good to have that support system of people who will not isolate you the second you, you screw up or anything like that. Um, yeah. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? So do you have a large online community? Yeah. Um, I've got, I've got, a, I have a friend, a bunch of friends that I've met through because of our mutual interest in music. Um, and again, it started off as a lot of us who were mostly young, haven't really, our eggs haven't cracked yet. We haven't figured each other out yet. Um, and it's weird how like, and yeah, like uh, even though the, the friendship is based on music, it's just as important like, like a lot, that a lot of us are queer because it kind of reflects in the kind of music we, we enjoy and we connect with um, and how we share that with each other because, and all that kind of thing. And yeah, it really, um, let's see, how else I can I? Yeah, we've, basically, as I mentioned before, I've gone through many different friendships. That's the one friendship that stayed the same and that hasn't just like faded away throughout my life. Even, I even, even with like, with CCS, um, I, I love and appreciate all the friends I've made there, but I've moved away since. Um, I'm basically resetting once again but like that online base is still there. Um, but even then, like, just because I've moved away from them and we've, some of us have scattered different places, I've seen them again today here at the con um, and yesterday. And it's like we, it's like we, it's like I never left. And it's really nice. Well, how, how can you keep that alive online? I mean, does it stay a lot? Do you think it, that, that being online can be nurtured just being online? Or do you think you have to have those touch points where you, where you connect physically, like, you know, like I, in, in the same spaces. I will say, I do think like, I think both are very, very important. Um, just like being able to keep up with your friends, like that for as much as I rag on social media, being able to keep up with my friends is what has helped nurture those friendships, even when we're apart. Um, but also when we get together, um, it's very, it's very like friendships are very different online than they are in person. And having that in-person friend group can help you feel less alone because you're physically there with them. You're physically talking to them and that kind of thing. I love all my online friends, but I do wish I could like, see them in person more often because, I don't know, you always, you always build a character behind a screen. So just like having that in-person conversation, you, 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 you understand them a lot better, um, especially if like, you know, Stuff happens. Yeah. So, what are the what are your future plans, people, for uh, your comics and and friendship? Uh, like, I feel all of you write about friendships and and networks. And do do you, is this conscious? Do you is it just spilling out of your natural lives or, um, mm -hmm. Archie? Yeah. The, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I think it is like a conscious choice, but it's also like what I want to focus on in my work, my past work and my future work. Um, to me, like friendship and you know, palship is like just as important um, as like romantic relationships. It is like family, you know? Um, and I think kind of like exploring that in comics is like really exciting to me. One, because it does, like Grease Bats was like a fun reflection of like me and my friends' lives. Um, and then I, I think that like friendship is also like all relationships like incredibly complicated. Um, and to be able to explore like the nuances, the fighting, like what we don't say to each other, like what you don't tell your best friend. Um, is like I think like an exciting spot to 
to kind of like dive into. Um, yeah. Did I answer that question? I can't really remember yeah. the full yeah, part of it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Mama? Like, Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I have been lousing that up. Sorry, I just got I got so involved in. Yes. Okay, let's go to Emma's work right now. So sorry. I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> Never looked at that page way too long. Never again. Um, so yeah, it feels interesting being invited to this panel because I'm such a deeply pessimistic person. Uh, <laughs> I feel like every time I make a comic, there's the initial version where everything, can I swear on this? Am I allowed to swear? Yes. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm shocked I haven't sweared, sworn at this point. Um, yeah, I want everything to go to shit all the time just because it's, uh, it's therapeutic for me. But then like, uh, my girlfriend is an optimist, <laughs> which I acknowledge is good for me. and. Uh, whatever so I don't know there there's a part of it that's aspirational I, I don't think I ever want to make something saccharine where everything is okay for everybody but I, I think it's important to have um, tension and disagreements between friendships because friendships are uh, tenuous I've seen I've seen a lot of good discords go down mm -hmm. I've seen it um, I've been there and yet I see in your comics, like these comics in particular, they're, they're very tender, they're, they're very poignant, I feel like they're, they're, they're just really, I mean, she's talking about how frightened she is to be going out in public, you know, as her authentic self, and perhaps feeling in danger, and her friend is, you know, there for her, and so, you know, maybe you I don't know, and, and in LSBN, you know, the same thing. I, I mean, lots of crazy stuff happens in that one. It's a sci-fi, there's monsters and everything, and it's really great, but it also, and it also has a really great, like, hot, hot sex scene, too. <laughs> I, I would never. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting you say that, because I feel like I have a slate of things lined up that I want to work on, and all of it is, like, given X sci-fi concept, what dyke drama occurs. <laughs> but, uh, so I won't get invited to these panels anymore. <laughs> it's bad stuff is gonna happen. It's gonna be a nightmare. No, it's, really, it's really good, you should get you should it. <laughs> well, that one, that one isn't as bad. I'm going to get very evil. Really? No, I'm too soft. <laughs> I talk. A, I don't even talk a big game. <laughs> I pretend to talk a big game for three seconds, and then I call my own bluff because I'm incapable of sustaining it. <sighs> talk to someone else. <laughs> Lawrence. Um, what? Hello. Um, you have a chance. Boy, I'm just doing a bang-up job here, folks. So sorry. I'm better when I just have the keyboard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. key, Lawrence, you want to talk about your the, the why did you why did you give us these pages? Like, the, this is a page that they're all going out, and they're they're you know they're they're this is like the, their goofy stuff they're doing. They're gonna hydrate and they're gonna do mo dancing and. Yeah, uh, I wanted to um, kind of show what my experience was uh, when I moved to the Bay Area. So like. There's a bar in there reference called The Rio, and it's supposed to be El Rio in San What's Francisco. What's it called? El Rio in San Francisco. And so we used to go to a lot of queer yoki and queer nights like that. And um, it was the first place I experienced where a lot of black femmes were leading the nights. And so it was like nights dedicated to black queer folks. And I just wanted to like, Show that. So like that ice cream is a it's it's, which is from the Bay Area. And they're taking lactates because a lot of my friends are lactose intolerant. <laughs> so it, yeah, I just wanted to show something fun and joyous. Uh, typically I do a lot of mental health comics and I feel like they're kind of sad. And so this one is just complete joy. Like there's there's some moments in it that you're like, oh, but this one is just like complete black joy. And, yeah. yeah so. and And what about this one here? Yeah, so 
for the future, that stuff I would like to do. Like I would like to um, just have these slice of life moments between black queer folks and our own voices. Like even when I do panels, I switch my voice up because I've been kind of trained to have like an interview or a code switch voice. And if I'm uncomfortable or I don't know if like you'll understand what I'm saying, I won't say it the way I would normally say it. So to have a comic where I could just put like my voice and my friend's voice on the page, that's kind of what I want to do. And, and Blackbird does a lot of like that. Uh, I just speak plainly how we speak uh, amongst each other. So. Yeah, the code switching is something I think probably most of us can like relate to that. You know, how we like, I talk to my, you know, my girlfriends very differently when we're just together and uh, and when there's others around, I, I, you know, straight it up, you know, butch it up sometimes. Still, even to this day, and I'm old. So, yeah. And what about uh, right here? <laughs> this is another one. This is when, like, where the, the face is, like, get, I really like how you do the, it gets squinchy. Yeah, so that's, like, Tony is the one in the yellow. That's like me, where everybody else is getting dressed up, and I'm just like, oh, I showed up in the same clothes I was wearing yesterday, because I'm not a big dresser, so it was just like, I wanted elements of that. Like, I feel like when I watch queer shows, it's like sometimes it's a parody of queer life. Like, everyone's fabulous, and it's like, no, some people are born as hell. Uh, I'm a true, true introvert, so like, I'm not exciting when you meet me. Still queer. Um, so I wanted to put like all those kind of things in it because I feel like there's a certain way, to, like your book, there's not a lot of queer books like that. Like, so the fact that you made something like that where it's focusing on like 30 something years old, it's being messy, that's what I want to see in like mm -hmm. queer work. Because um, I do, I feel like you hear queer and then you think, oh, I know what that comic's going to be about. And it's like, well, that's impossible because there's so many different types of us. So, yeah. That's why I wanted to put Tony in there being born and changing his socks to yellow. Like, yeah. Let's see, um, I think we are getting, um, yeah, I think we should, yeah, I think we got about 10 minutes left. Um, anybody have any questions? Hello. Questions, anyone? Yes, could you just come over to the microphone and ask, please? Thank you. Oh, it's um, it's um, up, up over, it's uh, over yonder by the by the pillar. Sorry. <laughs> but thanks for getting on the stage. That was cool. That was awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just for Archie for writing Mimosa. Uh -huh. because I loved Grease Bats, and it seemed very like character driven, just like Mimosa is. But it seemed like I don't know, like should have thought of how to say this better. Um, Take your time. When you're, right, I feel like the writing for Grease Bats was really informed by like what you thought the characters would be up to next mm -hmm. and like it's spiraling right like that. Mm -hmm. But then since Mimosa is like one long story, did you write it differently? Because the characters still feel so like fun and real and messy, but it's, it kind of has like that part one, part two, part three mm -hmm. aspect, so. yeah. I was wondering how you did that. Yeah, um, writing those two comics were like was like pretty different, even though like be, just because the um, format was so different. Where with Grease Bats, it was like a group for folks that don't know, it's like a group of friends, um, and it was published monthly online, um, and so I couldn't really like dive into like each month had like its own little like kind of like plot or like a little story, but I, I didn't feel, because it was monthly, I could really dive into the characters like having interpersonal conflicts that maybe lasted more than that one storyline. Um, so with Mimosa, I was able to have those like messy moments, but kind of like had what maybe a character said at the beginning of the book irritate the character still at the end of the book or something, you know? I was able to kind of like um, just push it a lot further. Um, did that kind of answer totally, your yeah. questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else? Oh, yeah, great. 
I was wondering if any of you guys had experience trying to navigate specifically platonic um, online queer apps. Like I know Lex is really big at light now, and I know there are probably uh, sides of other apps that do that. Like uh, if any of you guys had experience trying to do finding meeting up online specifically. Um, I can speak on this, because um, that's basically what I'm doing right now. Um, as I mentioned, I moved back to uh, Colorado, where I live now, after CCS. Um, and where I live is a very, Boulder is a big place. Um, and it's full of queer people, but we're all scattered. Um, and there's definitely like some local places I should be visiting, but I've also found it very easy to just connect with people through dating apps. Um, I've um, mostly just found yeah, it's, it's basically everyone I've asked with is queer because I am androgynous enough that cis people don't really get me, but also like, but also just like, just queer, also androgynous enough that like the non-binary and like trans people kind of side eye me like, oh, what's your deal? <laughs> um, and um, yeah, like I evidently haven't had much luck dating, um, but I have found a lot of new queer friends that I can talk to, so that's something. Anyone else? Yeah, dating apps are weird because, oh, I didn't even need to say any more, did I? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, like, I have made a few friends on there, but also, it doesn't matter what you put in your profile, there's some dudes out there that, like, they think they're the exception, and they got to shoot their shot. I tried, gr oh, I tried Grindr twice, why am I telling people this? Because <laughs> we want to hear it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I only met someone from Grindr in person once, and we got a drink, and it was very awkward and bad. And then I also got to see a lot of dicks, and they were fine. <laughs> There's a certain point where you know they start to look the same. Uh, another. This is not related to your question. I'm sorry. Just I can stop talking about Grindr stories, but lots of um. Lots of dudes who are like, I know I'm not what you're looking for, but I hope you find what you're looking for. Um, including one of my ex-coworkers who, that, that sucked. Oh. Oh, he's, he was older too. It's fine. We aren't friends. He was not in my queer friendship space. <laughs> Um, that actually, it's funny because that reminds me of like the ally thing, you know, like, oh, I'm an ally. And we hear that a lot. And Lawrence actually has a real um, <laughs> very funny, um, there's an ally in Blackboard who's anything but, um, but they loudly trumpet that they are an ally. Um, if y'all, any of y'all have that experience, like uh, other than, and Emma, you've had some, yeah. I don't think they ever use the word ally. No. no, it's like, I've, I think I've had the fortune for like everyone who's ever been like an ally. It's like, okay, that's an egg, that's fine. Um, I'll come back to you in two years and uh, you won't be an ally anymore and you'll just be, you'll be in the fold, you'll be in the queer friendship space. <laughs> I'm bringing it all back, it's great. Oh, yes, hi. Yeah, hi, um, I wanted to ask, you know, kind of the autobiographical nature of this work how do you feel like it's improved your friendship with yourself? This is open-ended. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I've, I've, I've had friends who've joked about this, but I think I put a lot of myself in pretty much all of my characters, especially in Young, Dumb, and Queer. Um, they're all based on several different friends that I've met throughout the years, but I think a lot of their kind of like anxieties mirror mine. And I think being able to understand those anxieties and having people that you know will like, you know, they'll read that, they'll understand. Maybe they'll even like echo some things that like the characters say. I don't know, I think it helps, I think it helps me like, I think, I, I think it does kind of help me understand myself more because I mean, obviously I'm writing this from a real place. Um, I don't just like, like obviously like not everything is like super personal and not everything is based on like my whole life, but still a part of me in the kind of topics I decide to talk about. Um, 
and why they're even on my mind in the first place. And sometimes it can be a good therapy to just like have basically treat it as like a conversation with yourself. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, I think like one of the best and most important aspects of like friendship is that friends act like a mirror to yourself. They reflect you back. Um, like if you, they, you know, frequently, I, when I'm talking or discussing something with a pal, like they know me so well that it's like they can see aspects of like me that maybe I am missing at, at times. So I find that being able to kind of like work through things in comic or like work through things in comics is similar. It feels a little bit similar where it's like I see aspects of like myself or my relationships kind of like reflected back that is maybe a little bit subconscious. Um, but then being able to like, why did I put that in the comic? Or like, how does this character feel? Is like, oh yeah, that's how I feel too. Um, so it's like, yeah, it kind of like reflects back that in a way that doesn't necessarily feel intentional until I read it back to myself. It's also interesting because um, specifically with trans girls hit the town I remember there being a point where I was like, it feels like one of these characters is the old me and the other one is the newer me. But now they both feel like they're long gone. Um, <laughs> they're not sleepy enough. I, can't, I cannot emphasize this enough. I want to take a nap so bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have a practical question. It's my first time at SPX. Um, where should I go after this to make friends? Um, also, given that I have a hard time understanding people in like crowded and loud spaces. Any tips? I don't know. The people at the tables are probably very tired. I can talk about other things than being <laughs> sleepy. Um, oh. Does everyone want to tell where your, where your tables are? Maybe? I guess so. Would that help? I yeah. remember this. We got to wrap up, oh. actually, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Do you remember your table number? Yeah, so my ta I'm at table um, J5A. Um, and then I, I don't really, was that, I don't know if that question was about like, you're at SBX, you want to meet other like cartoonists and like yeah. other fans of comics and stuff. and. Um, it is so, I just like, it is very overwhelming. The ceilings are very high and like, it's just like a little dizzying and hard to make connections. So I would say definitely like, if there are folks that you're interested in getting to know more, it's just like grab their card or like exchange social media stuff and then like do it at a choir space. Cause it's hard, but yeah, J5A. Yeah, and Emma, what's your table? Uh, W28B. You know the one. Yeah. <laughs> Lawrence? Uh, L14. And Al? I will make this super quick. I totally understand. I am the same way. For me, I am a si I'm like a desk friend. I tend to befriend everyone beside me, including Archie, because I happen to be J5B right next to them. There you go. <laughs> and I'm at E12, and this has been lovely. Thank yes. you so much Thank to you. all of them. Thank all of you. Thank you.